Thank you very much for the panelists that shared so many heartfelt uh, real life stories as well as the researchers. It was great and the feedback was certainly wonderful. We're really excited about our last panel and Joyce, I got myself into trouble first thing this morning by saying that every one of our sessions were wonderful and they increased in the wonderfulness as the time went on. So I've been teased about that all day, but I was leading up to this panel that will be extraordinary. I'd like to introduce Dr. Joyce McConnell. We met her last night, but we're glad she's back again, who will moderate this group. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for sticking it out. Um, I think this panel will be worth it. Um, we're going to um, have a panel this morning that I think will pull together the reason why what we've been talking about is so phenomenally important in our state. Um, what we're going to do in this last panel is pull together what we know, which is we cannot be prosperous without education, without excellent edu education, and without a cultural shift toward a focus on innovation, entrepreneurship, and being able to attract the very best businesses to either stay in the state if they're already here and grow, or attract businesses from around the world. We know that there's nothing more important to a corporate CEO thinking about relocating a business than education. Um, so I, it's my great pleasure to introduce our panelists. Um, we have two panelists, our two uh, deans of business colleges, um, Javier Reyes from West Virginia University Chambers College of Business, and Avi, Am I saying that right? Good. Mukherjee. And Avi is the Dean of the College of Business at Marshall University. So what we're going to try to do here in this uh, end of the day program is to introduce you to these two fabulous deans, um, both of whom, oh, I should let you get mic'd. I'll keep talking while you get mic'd. Um, so Javier, many of you know, um, is the Milan Puskar Dean of what we now call the John Chambers College of Business and Economics. He started in July 2016 and he has never stopped. The College of Business and Economics is a, a raging success. Um, and we can say absolutely the same about Dr. Mukherjee. He's the Dean of the uh, Lewis College of Business and Professor of Marketing at Marshall University. And um, there, there is much that connects these two, um, our northern big school and our southern big school. Um, but something that unites them that is very recent is they both received major gifts from the CEOs two, actually, CEOs of two of the largest, most recognized tech companies in the world, um, John Chambers from Cisco and Brad Smith from Intuit. And both um, John Chambers and Brad Smith are uh, from West Virginia, John from Charleston, and um, Brad Smith from nearby Huntington, I can't remember his hometown, um, but Canova, that's right, he's from Canova. And so John Chambers went to school at WVU, and um, Brad Smith went to school at Marshall University, and both of them have looked at where we are as a state and have decided that there is nothing more important to them than to give back to the institutions that helped them get to where they are and to turn around and pay it forward for those students and residents who are here. They want to see a prosperous future for West Virginia. And that's what we're gonna talk about today um, with our two panelists. I will be moderating. And so my first question to the two of you, and I'll start with you, Javier, and then we can pass it to Avi, 
is both of your institutions received what we call transformation, transformational gifts. What does that mean? What do you think transformation is for West Virginia? Well, first of all, thank you. Thank you, Provost McConnell. Thank you, Abby, for being here. Thank you for all of you to stay in for this, this panel. Uh, as I think about my, my answer real quick, I just also wanted to mention that there's one more thing that unite Avi and I in, in this new venture is we're very good friends. <laughs> we're very, very good friends and we have actually joined, uh, uh, this is our second panel together, uh, one outside of the state that you invited me to participate and this one where we are together, so thank you for being here again. But what transformational means for West Virginia is really from where I see it, we have an opportunity to think completely outside of the box. We have what I would say sometimes now, we have permission to do so in a way. And not just because before we didn't have to or we didn't want to, is now there is what I would say a, a, a seal of approval on the visions that have been put together by Marshall University, by WVU, uh, in conjunction with the West Virginia Forward Initiative. We have a plan, we have the will, and I think now we have the means, means from the resources, from the brain power, as well as the human uh, component of it. Uh, to me, that's what transformation will mean. Now, that's, now we can think about it. What will transformation mean when it materializes is when we are seeing a completely different perception of West Virginia, uh, not a perception that, I mean, we're, it's not about coal, it's not about our, 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 our culture. That's not, we, we are very proud of our culture, we are proud of Appalachia, we are proud of our, our thrive and, and our drive, but it's time to start thinking of the innovation economy in West Virginia, that we equate it with innovation, that we can walk across our main street downtowns and we see a different aspect of a digital economy, one that has design thinking, one that has innovative thinking, one that is driving entrepreneurship, and to be honest, and it will start uh, with education. It will start with education in this kind of forums. So I'll give Abby uh, a chance to also respond. So thank you again. You know, absolutely delighted to be here. Uh, West Virginia Forward is a great initiative of these two great universities and the state. Thank you, Provost. Thank you, Javier, for, for having me here. Uh, we are working together on a number of different initiatives, and, and as Javier said, this is a great time. I think this is a very special time for the state of West Virginia in so many different ways. The best part of it is, you know, I moved from Atlanta um, a year and a half back, um, and, you know, as we looked at the business climate, what really attracted me to move to this state in itself was the opportunities to make a difference. There is so much that we can do given the stage of the economy we are in. I think we are looking at a resounding comeback. We are looking at a major resurgence as a state. And you know our numbers, frankly, make that easier because we can only go up. Uh, there are so many different indicators that are not so pleasant, right? I mean, you know, when you look at the CNBC ranking of the best states to do business in, we have moved up two spots from the bottom. There are several indicators as far as entrepreneurship and innovation are concerned where we are still among the absolute lowest. Uh, access to capital, last year we were 47. We did not move up an inch, we didn't move either way. Uh, business friendliness, we are 49 out of 50 states. Technology and innovation, we were 50, in fact 49 the previous year. So there are things on which we are moving up. Clearly, you know, our quality of life, our cost of doing business, uh, the economy in general has moved up like 15 or 20 points, you know, a major comeback because there is a lot of optimism in the state about what's going on. But the state itself has a long way to go. And I think these two gifts, Brad Smith for our college and, and John Chambers for WVU, absolutely symbolize the, the, the resonance that our state's comeback is providing to the sons and daughters of the state. Uh, you know, West Virginians who are in, ca in Silicon Valley or in other parts of the country and they're really doing well based on the state public education they received in this state are thinking of giving back in a big way. And I think this is only the beginning of a very long journey of bringing back people who started from this state, went out and made big and want to give back. In particular, in our case, um, Brad Smith had been involved with the college for quite some time. He's on the advisory board of the business school and has been. 
And you know, this year, in, in this month actually, he's uh, completing his term, he's stepping down from the role of an active CEO, he will still be chairing the board and doing other, he's on the board of Nordstrom and several other companies. But this is the time when he, you know, obviously wants to come and do more for Marshall, he had been involved for a long time. And when I see this gift, I mean, this is a culmination of several things we have done over the past few years, and it is going to completely transform, reimagine what we do as a business school. I think there is an internal transformation involved in this. There is an external transformation involved in this. The internal transformation is the way we think about ourselves, is the way our students think about studying and learning business. Uh, there is going to be a lot more focus on innovation. There is going to be a lot more focus on an innovative curriculum. Uh, we are going to add design thinking, of course, but the very approach to learning uh, will be changed, hopefully, through a highly futuristic curriculum that will involve uh, transdisciplinary learning, that will involve more experiential aspects of learning, that will involve interdisciplinary things, that will involve global footprints, and so on. So uh, a highly revamped curriculum and a very new way of approaching learning is the internal part. And of course, faculty retraining themselves as well to do that. But the external piece is equally interesting. We went back to the drawing board, and we have recently changed our mission statement of the college to include external engagement and community involvement as a critical aspect of what Marshall is all about. And, and we don't believe that, and, and I'm sure it's the same with WVU, we don't really believe that we can grow as a university without the state growing with us and without that part of the state in our case particularly growing with us. So, so we are in it together. This is a very exciting time and it is a true transformation of how we see everything around ourselves. Well, thank you very much for explaining that transformational vision. I think that's very important. I want to jump to the connection of that transformational vision and what you're talking about in terms of not only transforming the state, but transforming the way you educate in your colleges of business. So roll the clock all the way back, pre-K through 12. What do you think we need to be doing pre-K through 12 to prepare our students for the kind of innovative education and innovative thinking that you want them to be able to engage in? I think one of the things I really feel is that we need to introduce our high school students, or I would even say middle, middle school students, to fundamentals of business, entrepreneurship, personal finance, risk taking, uh, understanding the world of commerce, understanding the world economy. Uh, are extremely important and, and, and we don't see, I, I don't, and I'm new to the state again relatively speaking, but I don't see enough of that in our school curriculum at this point. Uh, we would need to see, I, I mean, you know, when we talk about STEM and we talk about business and we talk about entrepreneurship, they are interrelated. They are not really different at all and we have to bring them all together in the same breadth to be able to make it all work together. Entrepreneurship and innovation is the hallmark of our colleges of business. And so we should be able to work together with STEM initiatives and other aspects of the university and reach out to high school kids and get them to start thinking of doing something on their own. There aren't enough big companies, there aren't enough large company jobs, those economies are gone. And so the question of involving them as early as possible is critical. Now, we are planning, I think, and we are jointly going to work together you know, when we talk about collaboration of WVU and Marshall, we are talking about uh, meta collaboration because we have now, Javier actually has been the architect of it, and I have joined him in that endeavor to create a group of West Virginia Business School Coalition. All the business schools in the state have come together and we meet every semester to discuss where we are going, how we can work together, and how we can contribute back to the economy. So that's where the high school and middle school initiative is going to come in. And uh, getting students excited about the world of business and entrepreneurship as early as possible is really the goal. We want to keep them in the state. We want to make their ideas come into fruition before they graduate from college uh, so that they continue to invest in the state and, and attract capital and people and, and grow jobs. I, I, I want to second uh, what Abby just mentioned about the idea of we, 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 we have a group of the, what it's the deans or directors of business programs in the, in the higher ed spectrum that are part of our agenda, that that meeting is actually this, this Friday. Uh, part of our agenda is how do we work with the K through 12. Uh, I'm actually bringing part of our report of the Governor's School for Entrepreneurship and how that has evolved. Uh, is we have it one more year at WVU and then it will perhaps be uh, uh, put across the, for a competition again. 
But we've been talking in that, in that table across with all the, the deans and directors. There has been one topic that has really has us thinking heavily about this is how do we help the K through 12 system, especially middle schools and high schools, which is where we think we can, we can play better. How do we help those teachers and those schools? Uh, I, that is where, and we're trying to figure out, okay, we, somebody just mentioned about that when we do summer programs, we're struggling to attract those students to take those summer programs. When we're recruiting for the Governor's School for Entrepreneurship, it's been hard to recruit those students to come. We believe right now, and part of our agenda this Friday includes the conversation about maybe what we have to do is do what we have done with Finance University. Some of you may be familiar with Finance University, and Finance University is a program that it was established before I came to WVU uh, in conjunction with the, if I remember, it was a, not this, I think it was the state auditor or the state treasurer. That it was a treasurer. Uh, and the idea was to provide funding to bring teachers to Charleston for three or four days to give, be given a program on finance and financial literacy that they would take back to their institutions. Um, that program was, the funding was cut, cut for that program. When I was coming in, I said, no, we'll keep that program alive and we'll find a way to fund it. We have been able to keep it funded and now we have actually turned our development teams to find resources to do it. I believe that we need to bring not only finance university, but just business university type of planning to the teachers and perhaps do it in our campuses, perhaps have them come for us for a week and be able to be embedded in our campus as a cohort and then bring back programs to them because I believe it's easier or more sustainable to help the teachers because they become the strong and robust network than to try to educate each and one of the students that are in those middle schools and high schools. So we want to, that's, that's one of the conversations we have this Friday to see should we shift to provide our support to the teachers, still having our summer camps, but really try to do a summer camp for teachers just like Finance University. And then if we do that, I will present a question to the legislators in the room and for people to take back home with is, we need to make sure that when we send those teachers back to their, uh, to their schools, they have the same resources across the table. It is not fair in my perspective to have $100 versus $25 to buy supplies. We need to send them with the same level of resources so that, that, is a, that, that we're trying to level the playing field across, across the state. So the, some of what you've talked about um, ranges from financial literacy to innovation to uh, business expertise and business support. And I, I wondered if between the idea of innovation, entrepreneurship, and business support, you could actually clarify for everyone, what's the difference in educating our students and our residents between innovation, entrepreneurship, and business practices? You want to try that first? Well. <laughs> <laughs> You know, one of the questions that we receive all the time when we talk to our students and their parents and prospective students and so on is, you know, we, we, we have launched this, uh, we, have, we have a major in, in entrepreneurship and innovation. Um, and we have a minor as well. So, so in the business school, you can have a four-year degree in entrepreneurship. You can also have just a 15-credit concentration or a minor, uh, which is open to all students across the university. When we talk about the major, we faced a, a big problem of convincing students that all they want to know is entrepreneurship. That's not what our students felt they ought to and their parents felt they ought to. In other words, most of the parents would say, well, I want my kid to, to work in a company, a large company. I don't want him or her to be an entrepreneur, at least at the beginning. So would a program like that take them in the wrong direction? That's, that was the kind of question. And the answer we have kind of thought through are multifold. One is that first of all, entrepreneurship does not mean that you have to have a startup. It is thinking like an entrepreneur. So that is the first thing, right? It's the willingness to take risks. It's the ability to be an intrapreneur within a company. And therefore, we are looking at business innovation, corporate innovation, entrepreneurship within a company, intrapreneurship, as, uh, as one aspect of what we are doing. So traditionally, an entrepreneurship would be starting a new business, a startup. Uh, innovation is more focused mm -hmm. towards larger and mid-sized companies or smaller, but still not absolute startups, something more established. 
and then business practices would kind of transcend them both. Uh, but entrepreneurship by definition, as opposed to the way traditionally we teach business, is interdisciplinary, um, it is experiential, it involves an element of doing and learning by doing, uh, and so it is different because it is not so much of the theories per se, the theories are not fundamentally different between business and entrepreneurship, it's the way one approaches the problem. So, you know, when Brad Smith talks about design thinking, which is what has been his, his whole, you know, philosophy of business has been around design thinking. And, you know, the whole, our momentum kind of started in this area uh, in 2017, uh, when Brad came back to Marshall and organized what, we, what was called the Design for Delight competition, the D for D. And the idea for D4D for D was that student groups within Marshall to start with would think of real life problems, social problems, and try to solve them using a design thinking approach. So they identified there were seven groups formed from across the campus, and we want to actually extend it to outside the campus involving high schools and other colleges. And these groups of students under the faculties as mentors started addressing, one group started looked at substance abuse, one group started, well a few groups actually looked at substance abuse, some groups looked at education, and some groups looked at technology in, in, in the workplace. They were trying to solve these real social problems or issues using design thinking. And the end result of that was a competition between these dreams and the top three dreams went to Silicon Valley to make a presentation to, to Brad's company and had a tour of Facebook and other companies, which was really transformative. And that really took us down the path of thinking of what do we do with it. I mean, you know, D4D D was a start, but that clearly couldn't do everything for everybody. And so how do we imbibe that? And how do we start thinking of business education in a fundamentally different way? And I think that's where we are trying to get to uh, in terms of teaching courses that start with a real life problem rather than a theory. So it's highly inductive, highly interdisciplinary, and highly experiential. Uh, that, that is essential to learning entrepreneurship and innovation. I think one of, one of the, the areas where when you're trying to think of innovators, entrepreneurs, business, innovation doesn't have to lead to just the creation of a new business. Innovation can be just the way you solve problems. It can be the way you address your, even your day-to-day -day life, how you get to work in a different way, how you get to accomplish something in a different way. So teaching innovation does not necessarily have to say you have to do a business or have to be an entrepreneur. You just have to think differently and try to find different solutions. Entrepreneurship might be more of, okay, how do you make that a replicable innovation in a way? Meaning you just found a way to do something different, either within a business or within the, your everyday to, to their life. How can you make it now the way of thinking for others? Or how can you actually replicate it? And then if you can replicate enough and it's solving a need for a market, then you will be creating a company. The interesting thing is out of these three, the innovator, the entrepreneur, or the business leader, they don't have to be the same. There could be three different ones, completely trained in a different environment. There could be an innovator in biology who happens to meet an entrepreneur in business who then fund that somebody that they bring a team to fund a new company in biometrics. That is the trick and what Avi was referring to. This has to be interdisciplinary. It cannot be your one and one area. It has to be across the board. And to, to, be, uh, to be honest, one of the things that we have to recognize, and I invite everyone in this room to, to think about this, when you think of entrepreneurship and successful startups and new companies, the ones who created by com being part of uh, the educational platforms that we provide from K through 12, then going to community college or going to a four year institution and doing a master's degree, the ones who create a new company through that track, I would call the non-traditional entrepreneur. The traditional entrepreneur might be more one that comes out of a community, found an idea, is trying to get and then that idea is what sometimes they bring to the college, but eventually they may not even go to college in some cases and still make the new company. Entrepreneurship doesn't have to happen in the educational system. The community has to nurture entrepreneurship. Now we do need some of those entrepreneurs and innovators to go through the educational systems because they're the ones that will be connecting with those innovators and entrepreneurs outside to make them perhaps into accelerate them into companies. So 
To me, innovation, entrepreneurship, and business can be three different persons or three different individuals. When you find three of those separate that can work as a team, that's phenomenal. When you find one that can do all of them, you have a John Chambers, you have a Brad Smith, that's what you can find. So I've heard two important things that the two of you have raised. And one is the idea that the, um, the impulse for innovation um, includes risk taking. And entrepreneurship may or may not actually be um, motivated through the educational system. So that's one. And then the other is scalability. How do you take these wonderful things that the two of you have been doing in your colleges and scale them up to make it possible for West Virginians to have access to that? So I want to go to the first point, which is how do you, um, in a state like West Virginia, change the mindset so that an entire state begins to think of innovation and risk taking as something that is not only okay to do, but possibly leads to success? Uh, I, 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 we've had a theory about this a little bit in the past two, three years that I've repeated in different venues, so I apologize if you've heard it before. But it is, the, the, the art of risk taking, and Mike Green is here, so I think he'll appreciate this, the art of risk taking it's not taking every risk you can, right? <laughs> it's actually finding the ones that you know are really well thought risk, risky innovations, risky business, but that have an upside that it's sort of a calibrated risk. For us as a state to find that, the biggest thing we can do is that we need to learn to focus. We need to understand that if we have $100 to give, instead of giving $2 to 50 people, we may want to give 50 to two people. And when that grows, then you give another 50 to two other, and then another 50 to two other. But if we continue to try to spread everything so, so wide with a one inch depth, that may continue to allow us, and we say, well, taking risk. We're taking risks, but we're not putting enough of an investment to really make it happen. So what I would invite all of us to think about is, can we solve the educational system? Can we solve the opioid crisis? Can we solve the, part the, the participation, low workforce participation rate in the state? I think we can. But it's going to require really calculated risk-taking initiatives that can expand, and we should be willing to take those steps and not think that we can, in overnight, switch a, flip a switch and solve it all. That to me is how can we help change the state is we should be willing to take calculated risks and get buying on that calculation and learn to say, for, we're going to put our blinders for these two things right now for this year or these next two years to focus on it and not get distracted by but look at the overwhelming need that we have, and you want to continue to give little to many. No. Mm -hmm. Can we learn to focus our resources? That will change how West Virginia operates. I totally agree. Uh, you know, we need to create a community, uh, a network, a network of um, entrepreneurs, innovators, and like-minded people who are in it together. I mean, one of the critical success factors of a new venture is mentorship, and mentorship of people who have undergone similar challenges. So you know, there's a lot of as aspects attached to, to, to role models. Um, you know, we have just started in, uh, at the Lewis College of Business a week to celebrate women entrepreneurs. It's called the Women Entrepreneurship Week. Now we all know that women are growing as entrepreneurs at an extremely fast rate. You know, most of new businesses are started by women in the world today, and particularly in the US. And West Virginia doesn't have that trend yet enough. The growth has been far slower here than the rest, you know, most of the country. And so again, how do we create that group? And part of the answer lies in, in having these sort of professional networks. In Georgia, we used to have the Technology Association of Georgia, the TAG. 
as we called, which used to have meetups every week in Atlanta or other parts of the state where everybody would go, huge membership. Actually, the largest technology council in the country mm -hmm. is TAG. And you know, just being a TAG member, one would be able to meet people who are in similar issues and get help and so on. Uh, New Jersey, where I lived before I went to Georgia, was, uh, has the New Jersey Technology Council, which is very similar in nature, even though it's actually smaller than the Georgia one. But we need, we need networks like this. And I think the two big universities can do that. I think West Virginia Forward is precisely an effort in that direction. And if we do events like this and more events like this, you know, bringing entrepreneurs together, bringing thinkers together, we'll be able to reach there. Ecosystem is critical. Having support services is critical. One of the reasons why the state has lagged behind is because we don't have that support base of support companies, you know, whether it's financial services, whether it is venture capital, whether it's angel investors, whether it is market research, whether it is legal services. There needs to be a, an availability of all of this, and therefore incubators are important. Startup West Virginia that, that, that you are working on is so important. These things, you know, we are building a new incubator in Huntington now. Marshall is working on one uh, with Brad Smith support. It's, it's we have to get the community to come and experiment in an environment where failure is an option. Uh, we have to learn to fail, and, and that can only happen in a somewhat simulated, protected environment. Um, also, some of the clusters that Javier was talking about is really critical. We need to focus, uh, absolutely. I remember in Georgia, uh, the Georgia Economic Development Authority had developed uh, these sort of, I think, nine or 12, the governor's office had identified something like 12 industries that Georgia as a state would focus on in the next decade. Now, one of the primary ones was movies. Uh, you know, Georgia is the second largest producer of Hollywood movies right now, uh, and may become the first, the, the largest actually very soon. And there was a lot of startups around that. A lot of investors came in and started developing softwares for movie production or movie editing. Um, you know, there were, there were different people from, you know, from cosmetologists to barbers to other people who were supporting the film industry uh, as people came down to, sh to, to shoot their films there. So what are those sectors? And again, West Virginia Forward is the answer to a large mm -hmm. extent because we have identified those sectors. But I think if we can provide incentives to developing an ecosystem in each of those sectors and not really invest in other things because we have to, we have to focus, uh, we will be able to get some sectors that where we can be really good um, in, in the country. So we need more success stories and we need to focus on some successes first. So one of the things that, um, and this is gonna be my, my last comment, and then I'm gonna open it up to questions to the group, but it seems like it looking at West Virginia Forward and the power that West Virginia Forward is having in terms of shaping even this dialogue, um, and knowing that we have two-thirds of the partnership here, um, and the third being the um, West Virginia Department of Commerce, um, representing all of the interests of the state. It sounds like part of what you're saying is that for the very first time, we actually now have a, a map forward that can help us really um, align where we're going to go on the journey. So how we're going to reach those goals. Um, and what I'm hearing, and, and maybe this is a good note to end on, and we could take a question for, for our deans, um, but I think a very positive place to end is that what we've been doing over the last two days is really um, having that conversation that you say we need to have, putting the relationships together, creating networks, but we're also creating opportunities for alignment um, that I think are very important both in terms of education, pre-K through life. Um, some of my health friends would say that it's really um, in utero to death. <laughs> um, and in, in terms of education and ability to succeed. Um, we're talking about the educational system. We're talking about pre-K through 12 aligned with um, the CTCs and then with the four years and then beyond into continuing education and certifications. And then we're also talking in parallel about how we align all those businesses and then how we connect what we're doing with our educational system 
to prepare that human capital and workforce for that new economy that we're trying to build. So I want to close on that because it is a, a, a wonderful message to end on and ask if there are any questions from people who, who have stayed for this entire afternoon. We want to make sure that you have an opportunity to uh, ask a question of the deans. Rocky? Thank you. I think that was a really helpful conversation and you know, it's what you brought out uh, about using this example and extrapolating that partnership more broadly to the full spectrum of education and education policy. I know we have a lot of collaborative efforts that have been talked about in partnership. Clearly you both have talked about things like trust and being very good friends and having a shared vision and a blueprint to align that map to align to work together. Any tips or suggestions on how you had, I mean, there could be even martial competitors in some areas. How did you get past that to work together to get that trust, friendship, and aligned vision and map? And what suggestions would you have for the rest of us as we, as we talk about these issues brought and brought? Well, I, I can tell you that although I would like to suggest that it was a friendship that, if, that started out of nothing or just serendipitously, it does have, it did have people in the state getting us together, right? It had a, a Marty Becker who understands the landscape. It had a, a, a Bob, Simpson, Bob Simpson who was his predecessor uh, getting together in ACSB. But I can tell you that the, the trick, or perhaps from my perspective, the, 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 the point, the, the starting point of the conversation was the reality is, it's not about Marshall, it's not about WVU, it's not about Abby Mukherjee, it's not about Javier Reyes, it's really about West Virginia. When you lead in this state where it's about West Virginia, every door that you wanna open, opens. And that to me has been, as Abby mentioned, he came to a state because there was a purpose, he could see it. I came to a state in a way people say, well, why are you going to West Virginia? You're doing well at Arkansas, things are going well for you, why? I say, well, because there's something to be done here. And I've said this publicly, and this is where the competition does come back. And I said, I don't think there's any other business school in the nation that is as important to its state as the Chambers College of Business and the Lewis College of Business as well. <laughs> right? So to me, it's, it, that, it's leading with that. It's not about our institutions, it's not about our individual's uh, goals, it's actually about the, the goal for the state, and that's where everybody can play in a united front. So one of the things I, I wanna point out is, this is a wonderful um, experience, I think, for everyone to see West Virginia Forward and the West Virginia Public Education Collaborative um, coming together once again, and we've done it several times, but where these two entities um, who are doing wonderful work on their own are actually coming together to start to build this complete alignment between pre-K through 12 and what it is we need to do in terms of a prosperous future for West Virginia. And um, I wanna thank everyone who has stayed for the length of this conference. I particularly would like to thank all of our um, supporters and donors. Um, as we said last night, the Benedum Foundation has been very critical to the West Virginia Public Education Collaborative, um, as it has been, I know, to West Virginia Forward. Um, and what we want to do now is to tell you that the West Virginia Public Education Collaborative and West Virginia Forward, I think are really exemplars of exactly what our two deans are talking about, which is build alliances, collaborate, don't focus on the individual need of the institution or the operation, but focus on the greater good and the greater purpose, and that is West Virginia, and that's why we're all here. Thank you all so very much, and thank you to our two wonderful panelists.